here. So uh, welcome. Uh, we're going to uh, today be taking on that third leg or third tri third of the triad of sort of most basic, um, most foundational elements within applied category theory uh, to wit natural transformations. And uh, this is a, a topic which uh, I covered earlier in the discussion group, but I decided to defer this time because um, there didn't seem to be an absolute requirement to, um, to explore it before we started to, to, to sort of uh, had some rather interesting examples, things like uh, uh, categorical databases, for example, um, or um, representation of product, co-product, universal constructions. Uh, strictly speaking, um, um, while it's useful to have uh, some coverage of natural transformations for those, um, you know, I think from a didactic standpoint, it can be valuable to, to build up um, a better appreciation of, of things like functors, um, uh, contravariants, uh, and categories before um, layering onto it uh, this issue of natural transformations. Because not only is it a, a third leg, but it's, um, it's one that builds very much on the other two. Um, but uh, it is also uh, this leg that affords us this uh, much greater flexibility in exploring topics here in category theory. And I had shown this diagram last time, um, but natural transformations will open up for us a, uh, a lot of different types of uh, topics that otherwise would have been hard to cover. And it will further um, lend an appreciation for some topics you've already seen, uh, and and you know deepen your appreciation for um, for things where it's less essential but still useful. Things like product categories. Um, so I'm looking forward to digging in the, into this with you. And you know, just as with functors. We'll figure and and universal constructions. We'll figure out how much time we need based on feedback um, from you folks. Uh, but I did want to uh, cover uh, this from a certain perspective, um, one that knits together what you would have heard in the programming with categories uh, course videos with uh, what you would have heard in Bartosz Milewski's um, separate category theory for programmers uh, uh, course. Uh, and to that end, uh, I'm going to switch over to some slides here. Um, and we'll begin what may be the first of several sessions on this or not, depending on your interest. Um, okay. Um, so uh, just a few notes or or sort of these are more reflections um it's not miscellaneous notes it's it's reflections on the material or or central topics uh, central themes uh central topics i'll call uh, from those videos um so natural transformations um uh are something that fits in wholly with this philosophy um of focus on interconnections in the context of uh, category theory. Um, our interest lies uh, not just in the pieces of the system, but how they're connected. Um, we distinguish things by the roles they play in the category. And, um, you know, while we pay some attention to the kind of the nouns of category theory, the objects, a greater amount of attention is applied to the verbs, kind of the things that that, that map object to object, um, these morphisms. And um, natural transformations fit very much within that picture. Um, but they're not, they're not mappings between objects, they're mapping between morphisms, they're mapping between functors um, that are structure preserving. In category theory, something that may not be obvious um, uh, yet is the fact that 
uh, with natural transfer, or excuse me, with category theory in general, when we consider morphisms for a category, um, we do so often, particularly focusing on on structure preserving morphisms. Um, uh, and uh, sorry, I, I I just gotta close this uh, this Hangouts window. It's gonna uh, it's, it's it's Google Chat. It's gonna um, uh, cause lots of lots of problems unless I I stop it. I think um, hopefully that will do the job. Okay, so um, in category theory, when we talk about morphisms between things, uh, our focus is normally um, structure preserving morphisms. It's morphisms that are well behaved, that are lawful at some level. So when we focus on mappings between categories, our focus is functors because those are structure preserving mappings between categories. They map identity morphisms to identity morphisms, and critically, they map composition to composition. Those two kind of go together. Um, when it comes to kind of monoids, um, and we'll, that is the subject to which we'll return, we saw it in the discussion group, the mappings between monoids are monoid homomorphisms, and we have a category of monoids, and the mappings between them are, are the homomorphisms. It's not to say there's no other mappings that kind of scramble things in some sort of jumbled way, but, um, but the ones we care about are the ones that are, are lawful, that are structure preserving. Uh, those are the morphisms that are typically represented in a category. Um, and you know we'll have vector spaces and mappings between vector spaces. Or here with natural transformations, we'll have a category of functors where the objects are functors and the morphisms are natural transformations these mappings between functors that are structure preserved. And again, it's, it's not that there aren't any other morphisms, it's just that the, the ones that we dignify with a category that we'd like to reason about formally, that we, that we um, uh, capture within our constructions are these structure preserving ones, um, uh, these ones that have these nice properties. And here, structure is preserved by this naturality condition. So, you know, a, a given natural transformation maps from one functor to another. And we'll go into this in, in much more detail, but maybe we have a functor F. That functor F maps from C to D. And then maybe we have a functor G also from C to D. It's very important that they be from the same source category to the same target category. So both these functors, F and G, they're different functors, but they map from C to D, both of them. Um, and the natural transformation is a mapping between them that guarantees some nice properties. It has this orderliness to it. It's structure preserving. Um, it preserves the structure in the sense that we can do things either at F, the functor F, um, the things we do are the lowercase f. Um, um, maybe there, uh, maybe this is a function. Um, maybe it's a, it's a more general morphism. But we can either do that thing in f and then apply the natural transformation, or we can apply the natural transformation first and then then do this uh, to to go over to g and then do the equivalent of that thing in g. And the fact that these commute. Um, the fact that if we go this way and this way, it's the same as, as in, for example, the same function as uh, going this way and this way, or in general, it's the same morphism, precisely the same morphism. If this were sets, this would be mapping an element, no matter which way you go, a given element here is mapped to the same element here, if, it, if this were the category set, for example. And with a natural transformation, this is not only true for a particular F, lowercase f, it's true for all morphisms F, okay? Um, and we call these components here, um, alpha sub A and alpha sub B, the components of the natural transformation. And the job of the natural transformation is to map one functor to the other using using a morphism within this category D. 
So this is a morphism. It preexisted. The natural transformation just says, hmm, I want that morphism for this component and that morphism for that component. Mm. So these are existing morphisms. Or you know, for example, if this were set, these are functions. If this were hask, these would be functions between types. Um, but uh, these these components are in this category D, whatever it is. And the natural transformation has for each A, A over here, it has such a component that maps F of A, what one functor does with A to what the other functor does with A, such that this square commutes for any morphism F. So it's a very strong condition. It's an extremely strong condition. It says, you know, throw any morphism at me over here in C. When I lift it with F versus when I lift it with G, they are compatible. They are consistent with one another. They might not be the same, like G might collapse things down, um, but, but we have this orderliness of the mapping between them that says, well, at least they're, they're consistent. Maybe this does it in more detail and then collapses it down uh, here versus you collapse it down first and then you do the G version of it, you get the same thing. Um, so uh, we label these, these components with somewhat maybe confusing to a lot of um, stu early students on the path. We label them with the object whose images in the two functors are being mapped. So we label this one with A because A is being we're mapping it from what F does with it to what G does with it, or F maps it, or G maps it. Okay. Um, so there's this naturality condition. Two sides of this, or what F, what where to map from what F does with an object to what G does with an object for two objects A and B. And these sides are how how F treats a morphism between A and B here and a morphism and how G treats that morphism. Yeah, yeah. Um, and as I say, the existence of a natural transformation indicates kind of compatibility between them. It's a pretty, as I say, it's a strong condition. I think it's fair to say, you know, I may be strung up on a lanyard for this, but I think it's fair to say that that any functor can be mapped into any non-empty functor, uh, any other non-empty functor, because it can always map via the constant functor to a single object, which is, and, and maps all morphisms in the source category to a single morphism, the identity morphism for that single object in the target category. Um, as long as the, the target category is not empty, there's this functor uh, that goes from one category to any other category any non-empty category. By contrast, a natural transformation, that's a really strong condition um, to have. I mean, it's not to say the functors aren't strong, but we can always kind of collapse down and, and have a sort of trivial or, or a trivial functor. But um, with the natural transformation, we're, this, this indicates some deeper commonality or or compatibility or consistency between these functors F and G. And it's it's not bidirectional. Like if, if there's a natural transformation from F to G, that doesn't mean there's one from G to F, not at all. Um, maybe uh, G is coarser grained. In other words, it collapses things that F distinguishes. And we can go this way at the finer grain level then collapse down uh, or we can go this way, collapse down first, and then then do it in the coarser, sort of cruder way of doing it in G, uh, where we don't make certain distinctions that we would have in F. Um, and that can be perfectly fine. They commute. But we can't go the other way in general. Um, so, so there's an indication of strong compatibility here, and it's directional, um, uh, that, that sort of G is, is compatible with how F views the world or something like that. Um, remember, both are functors. And so it's kind of, they're compatible on how they, they treat these things mapped over. OK. Um, and you know I love Bartosh's uh, 
creativity and drawing on kind of intuitions from uh, from diverse areas of life, uh, including from, from programming, but um, from other areas, as we'll see. Um, uh, from a, a programming perspective, uh, he likes to talk about finitary functors as containers. These are sort of these, these you could think of them as maybe something that contains something just like we have a list. We have the maybe functor, uh, we have a tree, or we have a pair, or whatever. We we have these containers, contain values. Fair enough. Um, and uh, even like something like reader functor, you can kind of think of it as maybe essentially defining a lookup table. Um, so be excused for thinking of them as containers. And you know, from this perspective, natural transformations are kind of orthogonal to functors. So uh, a functor maps cut type of contents without changing shape. So remember, for a functor in programming, we have an F map operation. It takes a function from type A to type B and turns it into, for a given functor F, uh, a function from F of A to F of B. So maybe this is, you know, is is even, and maybe f is list. And so given that we know how to determine if an int is even or not, mapping from int to bool, we can then go from a list of int to a list of bool, boom. And we could just apply, it, generalize that in, in, the, in the nice, rather nice words of Paolo, Paolo Peroni. Hold on for a second. I'm just gonna turn down the light and the heat. I'm broiling here. Um, so, um, oh, I see, I see, um, okay, uh, so I think, I think we're in better shape now. Okay, sorry about that. Didn't want to sweat oceans. Um, okay, um, so, so remember that lifting a function, uh, can apply it, generalize it to, to this functor. So, or, or you know, uh, Paolo has talked about it for monads, but it's true for functors. It, it kind of has a version of it for this functor. And a natural transformation, um, whoa, sorry. Um, uh, so, so, so this functor changes the type of the contents without changing the shape. You know, go from a list to a list. You go from a maybe to a maybe. You go from a tree to a tree. You go from a reader to a reader, uh, what have you. Um, that's what functor F, F map does. Um, and um, it changes the type of the contents from an A to a B without changing the shape. We still have a list. We go from a list and we come to a list. Um, um, by contrast, a natural transformation can be seen as changing the shape without changing the types of the contents. So it might go from a list of ints to a maybe event, or it might go from uh, a um, from a pair of 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 um, ints to a list of ints, for example, or a pair of the same types to a list of the same types. Right. Um, so here we're not changing the type of the content, but we're repackaging it. And we might, might only pay attention to the first element or whatever. Um, so he, he argues those are kind of orthogonal. And as we'll see, it's a useful intuition graphically as well in just a minute. Um, natural transformations, it turns out, are needed. Um, uh, for us to reason about functor, a certain type of functor composition we haven't talked about. We've talked about what's called vertical uh, composition of functors. You kind of apply one after the other. And um, in addition to that, there's horizontal composition, um, which is a little bit more, more subtle. Um, and we'll be covering it um, in a later lecture. But natural transformations are needed to, to kind of reason about that. Um, and 
And finally, I'll, I'll just say that Vartosh comments, and I think it's true, it's really useful to be able to kind of switch perspectives on natural transformations. There's kind of the component view, what it does for each object. Um, so each object mapped to from an object in C has this component associated with it. There are these naturality squares. But then, you know, there's this other view, and this is emblematic of category theory in general, where you pop up, you go meta, you pop up to the next higher level, and you reason about natural transformations as mappings between functors. And it's kind of a whole mapping, and you don't get into all the components and all the naturality squares. Um, OK. Um, so, so let's, uh, I'll, I'll mention just the detail about notation. Um, so uh, the notation for different types of transformations within category theory um, is uh, a little bit varied. There are these different sub-communities and people write things in sometimes a bit different ways. And I've seen natural, so natural transformations are almost always written with a, with a Greek letter. Um, functors are almost always written with a capital um, letter, uh, often with the letter denoted kind of a function-like thingy, like a capital F, a capital G. Um, maybe you'll see, uh, you know, capital H, uh, et cetera. Um, lowercase are often morphisms. Uh, natural transformations, by contrast, are written as these Greek letters. And their subscript is characterizing the object in the source category of those functors, your C, that is being mapped with this morphism from one functor to another. And again, there, there may not be such a morphism, in which case there's no natural transformation between F and G, and that's perfectly fine. That's a very special thing. Um, so there may not be one. Um, so uh, when we write it, generally speaking, we use these Greek letters. There is an exception, which is, I find sort of objectionably confusing, but um, category theorists aren't, aren't exactly listening to me. Um, uh, so uh, when we, when we write a natural transformation from the identity functor uh, onto T itself, um, sometimes this is written as, as T. Um, so S is T is, um, uh, uh, this is the identity functor essentially, um, right. Um, uh, this <clears throat> occurs in the context of monads particularly. And, when we have um, uh, a um, natural transformation, which goes from an identity uh, functor um, to T, this is not not well not well phrased here, but these are two functors. Um, this this natural transformation mapping this functor to this functor in this sort of way. This is identity, so it could kind of strip out F. It's it's just um, A. This is with endo functors where C is mapping to C. This would just be A. This would just be B, and this would be F. Um, when we have that a natural transformation that maps that uh, onto a um, an endo functor uh, applied to it called T. Normally, that's a monad. It's often written as T um, as the natural transformation as well, which again I find weird. Um, natural transformations uh, are also sometimes uh, written, well, they're written with the dot, arrow dot, or they're written with a double arrow. So I've seen them like that, uh, natural transformation from F to G, which one has to not confuse with Scala's um, notation for kind of a, a function arrow. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, so I'm, I'm gonna go a little bit deeper in this one. We'll see if we can ask any questions. So 
This is the basic naturality square associated with, um, you know, with natural transformations. For our funk, we have uh, objects in the source category A and B. They're uh, mapped over into the target category, and there's a morphism between them that's mapped into a morphism in the target category. So the morphism goes from A to B and, and category C, and therefore it goes from FA to FB. Um, uh, it's lifting, it's going from FA to FB when they're mapped with F, and the same thing with G. So maybe again, A is int, and this is, and B is bool, and this is list of int to list of bool, and uh, this is the lifting of a function, maybe is even, to operate on lists of, of ints to map them to lists of bools. Um, this a G might be maybe, in which case this is maybe event and maybe a bool, and GF is, is the the is even applied to the maybe functor, um, which turns a maybe event into a maybe a pool. Mm, we lift it to apply to that with F map, right? These are two F maps. And uh, this natural transformation, well, we'll we'll be examining some of them, but the one we'll examine first is Bartosz's uh, example on this, which I rather like, uh, to wit, uh, safe head. Okay. Now, if there are multiple morphisms in C, of course, those would look like this, right? There'd be an F of G and there'd be a G of G. The natural transformation would still be there. I mean, um, it's a natural transformation for any morphism F. So it applies for F. It also applies for G. It's a natural transformation um, only if this is true, this commutes for any F. Um, so it's saying these functors are, have this deep compatibility in how they lift things and, and treat the mappings uh, from these, these types over here. Uh, they have the deep compatibility um, for their semantics of lifting that this holds true for any morphisms. Um, now, Bartosz talks about this other intuition here. Um, and um, this should really say vertical cover, uh, or between sheet colored lines. So um, he gives a nice geometric kind of notion of this, uh, reflective of his background as a theoretical physicist. So here we have a source category and a target category. So this is category C and that's category D. Great. And then we have two functors. There's still two, despite the welter of, of different things going on here. Um, there's two functors. One is F, capital F, and one is G, capital G. Mm. And, you know, the, the intuition he likes to have is, look, you know, we have this category D, and maybe D is much bigger than C, and, and, and you know, the, a given functor serves to embed C within D. So maybe a given functor maps these objects, which are often much smaller than D. It's true. We have these index categories, which have this nice little pattern we're trying to find. And maybe it embeds it in a certain subspace here, like a sheet or you know, some manifold here, some thin sort of area of this, maybe, um, of the target category. Maybe G embeds the same objects when mapped um, into a different area. And naturally, the morphisms between these objects have to follow the objects. And so, you know, if we have object A mapped here and we have object C mapped here, the morphism between them is also in the sheet because the objects are in the sheet. Okay, so this is kind of the F, capital F sheet. That's the F functor image of C. Great. Um, F, capital F. Functor's job in life is to map C to D, and this is the sheet that does that reflects that mapping. And this is the sheet that reflects the G mapping. And you'll notice here G is actually coarser grain. So G has collapsed down D and E into a single object, right? Um, that, this object is is um, 
these are uh, just maintained as distinct objects here, but here they are um, collapsed down. Uh, and that's fine for a functor. We can collapse things down for a functor. There's no problem with that. It's a perfectly lawful functor as long as it preserves composition and as long as it preserves the identity. So the identity for D and the identity for E would be mapped to what here? Can anyone tell me? When we're mapping with G, identity in D and identity in E would be mapped uh, into what? So two identities. The identity of G, E, and G, D, which is the same object. Which is the same object. They're just mapped into the identity here. That's all. Yeah. Um, so that's exactly right. And any morphisms on D that are not the identity, we map to some morphism here. Maybe it's the identity, maybe it's another morphism here. Um, that's fine. And, and E, um, it's the same. Um, so these morphisms we mapped onto different morphisms from this object. So it kind of, you know, collapses down just like with modeling, we might have an age category in one model that's, you know, um, 80 to 90 and 90 plus, and we collapse it down into a category 80 plus, something like that. Or we collapse all children categories into the child category or something like that, or the child object. Um, we, we collapse them down. But this has to be lawful um, in terms of its mapping and, and it's a functor and, and so it is. Um, but then the question is, you know, okay, if we have this finer grain mapping up here, and then we have this coarser grain mapping, is there a natural transformation between them that guarantees this, you know, beautiful category for all functions f? And there could be, there could be. Um, we could have uh, so this natural transformation will be orthogonal to those sheets, is what Bartosz comments. Um, so um, it would have, for example, for C, color is kind of with the green color here, it would map where F maps it, the object to which F maps it, to the object to which G maps it, right? And this is a morphism in D. It's got to be an existing morphism. It's not like the natural transformation creates an amorphism. It just uses a morphism. And, and so it's relying on there to be a morphism. If there's a natural transformation, because there are these these morphisms that have this robust feature that they, they have this nice property. Um, so we have these, you know, going down and this collapsing or this way in which we translate from this to this, um, kind of the lens on, a, on C that we have with F versus on G, there needs to be a lawful enough mapping that we get this nice commutativity condition. We could either do things up here in F first and then map down, or we could map down first and then do things in G, and we're guaranteed to get the exact same result. It's the same morphism um, that, that results uh, that goes ultimately from this guy here to that guy there. It's the same morphism from FA to GB. Because remember, this composes with that, gives a morphism. This composes with that, gives a morphism. That has to be the exact same morphism, the exact same way of mapping from this to this. OK. Um, in the example, I, I rather like Bartosz's drawings. Um, but um, you know, he says, OK, so you have this, you have this kind of source, stylized source object over here. Uh, in the source category. And the functor F maps this stylized object, both its objects and its morphisms uh, over into this part in the, maybe this isn't sad, he says, um, or it maps it into this one. And here, this is kind of rendered as a <laughs> rather unfriendly looking dog. Um, um, and here it's mapped to a um, rather neutral looking person. Um, and uh, not only is the, uh, are the object mapped, so there's a kind of object here, it's mapped to the head object here um, on the person and that same object 
and from the source categories map to the head object on the dog, right? This rather frightful head, fearsome head. Um, and, uh, um, but moreover, if there's a morphism, says something from the head to the, uh, the base of the neck, um, uh, that's mapped over into a morphism here, which is kind of the human's neck. And this is kind of the dog's neck. And this morphism from the base of the neck to the, to the tip of the arm is mapped over here to a morphism that goes from the base of the neck to the hand. And here uh, it is mapped to the paw, not the city, but the, the, um, uh, the, the actual anatomical uh, object uh, of canine character. Um, so it's mapped down to, to this paw. Um, and, uh, and there needs to be this nice mapping between them by which, and the natural transformation here intuitively, it kind of says, you know, what, do, what are these things in the human correspond to and things in the dog, right? Um, it kind of says, well, the head, look, that's the head of each. You go from the head of the human to the head of the dog, and you go from the hand of the human to the paw of the dog. So and that's a great start, but it also has to have this consistency such that for any of these morphisms, you know, you can either go up here and then translate down or, or you know, go down and, and first and then translate, but you'll end up in the same place. So it needs to be a robust mapping, a mapping that gives you the anatomy uh, of, you know, the mapping between anatomies um, such, it needs to be robust so that you can go either way. It can't be some ad hoc thing where you say the ear of the human is the tail of the dog or something like that, because then things wouldn't piece together, um, uh, especially for dogs which have tails lopped in some weird way. Um, okay. So um, anyway, this is uh, Bartosz's depiction. And you can think of, again, natural transformation as kind of translating from the picture of C as rendered by F to the picture of C as rendered by G in a way that has to be deeply consistent. Uh, it, has to, it has to be compatible. Um, it, it's not just a willy-nilly uh, mapping. And, um, uh, one can be coarser than the other, or one can be just as articulated. Um, but um, but uh, we can't go uh, to something that's often we yeah it, it's hard to go for something that uh, is is uh, uh, going to something finer grained. Okay, so I'll, I'll I'm going to stop with one programming example here for for questions. Um, so with this programming example, um, you know, Bartosz um, likes to introduce uh, SafeHead. And uh, I do rather like this. And I've been alluding to this in my narration. So going from, if we have the source category Hask and we have the target category Hask, this is an, N, the F and G are endo functors. They stay within the same category. They map from the category to itself. Be a better way to put it. Um, we have int within Hask and we have bool. These are types uh, representing the set of ints and the set of types. And then we have morphisms, which here are, so these types are the objects and the morphisms are functions. Great. So here's the is negative function. It says whether an int is negative. So it maps from int to bool. And we can have a, a, a morphism list, excuse me, a functor list which takes any, any type here and turns it into a list of that type, right? So we have a list of ints, we have a list of bools, and we could have a list of lists, I mean, all sorts of things, great. Um, and this is equipped as a, more, as a functor, as a law-abiding functor, it's equipped with an F map. So it knows how, given something that maps between two types here and to bool, it knows how to lift them to go from list of int to list of bool. And the same thing is true with maybe. Great. Okay. So we have these two functors and they map from Hask to Hask and they can lift morphisms. And so any morphism over here, we can 
lipidomorphism here. Great. Um, but what we're seeking in a natural transformation is something which um, maps from list to maybe here. Because remember, a natural transformation maps from um, how one functor sees a given object like int to how another functor sees that same object in the source category like int. Um, that's the job of the natural transformation. It says how to go from F's int to G's int. So how to go from list, list event to maybe event. Okay. So we want something that will go here. And what he proposes is safe head, which has been weirdly capitalized here. And um, the idea is we want, we want a natural transformation safe head such that um, we can, from a list, get a maybe. Um, so if we have a list of int, it will, if there's a first element of the list, it will do just of that element. Um, but if the list is empty, it will create, what will I create it, it, for the maybe if the list is empty? It will put what? What would the value of the maybe be? It'll be what? Begins with N. It has a T in it. it. Ends with G. There's an H right after the T. <laughs> There's an N before the G. Nothing. Nothing. <laughs> Nothing. Um, uh, so, uh, it it is if if the list is empty, it gives nothing. Mm. And and here's the thing. And I mean, it's obvious. It, it it almost seems so obvious that we don't dignify, but it's actually a very strong condition. It's just that, as Bartosz says, Haskell is even a stronger condition of parametric polymorphism, associated parametric polymorphism, or um. Uh, so look, if you start with a, a list of ends, you know, one, five, two, minus four, whatever. And you first take the safe head of it. So again, the list is starts with one, two, four, minus seven, or whatever. Um, what is the safe head going to give you? If the first element is one, what is what is safe head going to give you? It's going to give you it's going to get, it begins with J. Just one. Just one. It's going to give you just one. Yeah. Um, it's going to give you just one. The list starts with one, so it gives you just one. It's a safe head. Okay. And then if we ask, is that negative? What is that going to give it? We lift is negative to apply to a maybe. What are we going to get? If we if we lift is negative to apply to a to a just one to apply to maybe. So we ma try to map just one. What do we get? Begins with a J. <laughs> It's last thing in it, it's a two token answer. The last thing in it is false. The fourth letter in it is T. Okay. I gotta have a hangman game. Um, just false. Just false. Yeah, because it's not negative. Okay. Just so, so safe head. We'll extract the first element because it exists here. So it abstracted. So this was list of one, two, four, minus seven or whatever. Um, we extract the first element safely. So we get just one. And then we lift is negative applied to a maybe. Just apply. If there's an element there, it applies it to it, right? Um, we saw that as recently as last time. It maps, if, it, if you got an element in hand, it maps it. That's great. 
So this was just one, this turns into just false because is negative is false for one. Mm. Okay, but now let's go this way. So we have this list, one, two, four, minus seven, whatever. Um, let's just suppose it's that, one, two, four, minus seven. Um, I don't particularly like that sequence, but it's fine. Um, so, uh, uh, so if we map that with, lifting the lifting of is negative to list what would we get out one two four minus seven what would we get out we get out a list of bools each of whose element is just a mapping of a, of a given int right the corresponding int in that list this is as paulo says this is the generalization of this function to apply to lists so it's just applying is negative element wise to, to list to get a, a list of bools. So what would that list of bools be? If with the list of ints was one, two, four, minus seven, what would this list of bools be? False, 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 true. Correct, yeah. Because one is not negative. Two is not negative. Four is not negative. Minus seven is negative. Okay, great. Okay, so we got this list. Uh, false, 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 true. And now if we do safe head on that, what do we get? Just false. Just false, which sounds familiar because it was what we got the other way, right? So if we go this way, we got just false because we took the original int, we extracted it into a maybe event, and then we uh, the lifted is negative to that. We got just false. Or we map the list before translating over with safe head. We map the list and then we translate over with safe head, right? So we can either apply the natural transformation first, safe head first, and then map, then lift is negative, or we can lift is negative and then apply the natural transformation. Okay. Uh, and the natural transformation, for this to be a legitimate natural transformation, this has to be true for all functions. And, you know, what's been realized, um, and I think it's Phil Waldler, who uh, the, the main, you know, mastermind behind Haskell, who, um, uh, who, wrote the paper saying theorems for free. I mean, essentially, if we confide ourselves to parametric polymorphism in Haskell, um, we provide such strong guarantees because we have to define a parametrically polymorphic function. That's what safe head is. It applies for any types. It can take a list of that type to a maybe of that type. The fact that we have to define that for all types is very strong condition because like for an arbitrary type A, like what are we gonna do with it? Like, like we have very limited options, right? Uh, if we knew it was an int, we could do something weird with it. Like we could square it or we could take it negative or we could add three to it or multiply it by seven or whatever. But A could be anything, it could be, uh, it could be a hash table, it could be a, a dictionary, it could be a, a list, whatever it is. Like, what are we going to do with it? We, it really constrains our options to be, have to write one rule for all types. And it turns out that that is so strong, it guarantees naturality in this way. Um, you're guaranteed to have this property maintained as a natural transformation. Um, you go from one function to another. Theorems for free. This condition is automatically met because even though naturality is a very strong condition, this parametric par um, polymorphism uh, is involves even stronger conditions that that um, provide that guarantee of naturality. And that's quite remarkable. But in elsewhere in category theory, you know, being 
being having a natural transformation between two functors is, is very very strong. It's very um, you know it's it, it it indicates something deep between those functors um, in terms of uh, how they handle things. Um, okay, um, and remember this has to be true for any of these um, any of these functions. Okay, um, so I've just talked a lot. Um, uh, I could, you know, I could go on for lots of other examples here and so on, but I want to answer questions or get some bit of discussion going. So, what's your um, thinking on this? What any questions on this? Any things troubling you? I think I'm okay with it. So like it's it's more fresh in my mind. I think this was towards the end of the discussion group. We talked about this. So mm. Mm. others, you want to ask some some questions? I could pull up the chat here. See if anyone's asking anything there. Oh, there's a chat. There's a chat. Just one. Oh, okay. Okay. Thanks, Alex. Um, I'll mo monitor the chat here. Alex has been trying to put forward the answers to my questions. It's telling me I have a meeting with Jenna in five minutes, but that's not my calendar. So I'll have to confer with Jenna about that. Anyone have a question about this or anything troubling you or, or you're wondering about or things you want to discuss about that? Maybe I will note that these are going to play a really big role with monads. Um, natural transformations, you may remember the view of monads as monoids in the category of endofunctors involve two types of natural transformations, join and unit. And for that, there was also co-monads, which had extract and and which had a uh, co-unit. Um, but these are like the, the, with unit, we're taking a identity functor on a, of a given type to, uh, well, taking the identity, mapping the identity functor onto uh, another functor like list. And this is the one we might call natural transformation list, but it's, um, you know, we're mapping from this to this. So this would be like taking it A and putting it in a singleton list or pick, taking a, a value and putting it into a maybe as just, just that value. Um, this is uh, associated with pure in, in some renditions of, of the library. Um, although that derives from applicatives, um, we can kind of use it. Um, it, it creates like a singleton for a list or a, a maybe just that, et cetera. That's a natural transformation. And so is these ones to like flatten. Those are natural transformations. Flatten a maybe. So if you have a just of just of three, you'll just, you have a just of three. But if you have a just of nothing, you have nothing. Um, if you have a list of two lists, you just flatten them, boom, flatten them into a single list. Okay. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah. So maybe any any questions though before I just make one other remark here. Questions, things to discuss, concerns, confusions. I consider natural transformations one of the slippier, more slippery con concepts in category theory, actually, for students to learn. So if you're not feeling like you have really if, if you're feeling slippery footing, it's for good reason, because I think these are, for a lot of students, this is where, like, things come to a halt, because uh, they feel it's too confusing. But I actually think, like, there's a lot of other concepts that go beyond, well beyond this, things like, uh, the, that are in that, that, that list. Uh, well, uh, humble. Um, this, uh, oh, gosh, um, now I'm really in trouble but on 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 this um this list uh which are much less slippery than natural transformations natural transformations require kind of that final push and then i think like galois connections even at junctions um some things with monads pre-order categories lenses pro functors i mean these are I, I, I think natural transformations are somewhat more slippery uh for students and so if you're feeling not not non plused about that. Uh, you're not feeling particularly thrown off. Um, you got to realize, like that's one of the more challenging things to know. Uh, but by the same token, I welcome questions here. Okay, so. Maybe I'll just say, um, you know, Bartosz has this, this, this diagram is problematic for, for two reasons. First of all, this GB is labeling this morphism. It's not labeling this, this thing. Um, but uh, the second thing is this arrow, this blue arrow should point to this guy here. Um, but what I was trying to show is something Bartosz said, you know, look, if you're dealing with set and each of these is an element in a set, Often we go back to set because set is familiar and kind of think of elements and but we have to be careful because the problem with with set is that there's no real structure to preserve and so set doesn't give us great intuitions with this with this notion of of uh, you know functors uh, preserving it, it doesn't with mappings being things that are nice and lawful uh, and so on. There's set, set, set can be kind of poor and thinking about certain types of things, but we can imagine like a, a set, you know, with two elements here. And when we map them, maybe there's others shown as well, but um, when we map it using F, um, so this is, this is a set, FA, it's this guy up here. And when we map it here uh, with FF over to here to FB, you know, each of those is, is mapped over um, to, to some subset here. I've kind of circled the subset. Um, um, FG is, is mapped over to a, a, a different subset, it may be, Maybe this this red one goes to this blue one here, um, and and so this might be you know bigger set. When we apply FF, it only maps to this subset. When we apply FG, it maps to this subset, um, mapping from FA to to FB. This is kind of a broader set. These are subsets in it. Okay, now same thing is true with G. Um, when we have this GA, uh, we have these elements and we have GB here. Um, and um, GF kind of maps this set over, over to here, but maybe it's a subset. 
And Bartosz's point was that um, naturality, which involves these mappings here, you know, we for, for this to be a natural transformation, going this has to commute for all of these functions. So maybe it commutes for um, so if we go like and we say, hey, where does the red one go here? We'll find it goes here. Okay. Um, and then and then we um find okay, it goes uh over to this to this red one here. That has to be the same as if we mapped into this and then map down. Um, and Bartosz, you know, noted for a given lowercase f, it doesn't totally constrain who alpha b is because maybe f, you know, mapping lowercase f with the functor f um, just occupies a subset. And we're just sort of constraining what it can map to here. Um, uh, by by saying that this has to commute, that these have to go around, isn't saying what the entire F entirety of FB maps to. Um, so for a given F, it doesn't constrain this, this mapping 100%. There may be other things not mapped to by FF, which, which are mapped here. Maybe these are double precision numbers and you know it only maps to positive ones, but these are negative ones. And those aren't really constrained by this condition for lowercase f. But once we consider that this has to hold for cap for any function, for every, in this case, function, because we're dealing with sets, um, then we start to get more constrained. It, it has to hold more generally. It's not just for lowercase f, it has to hold for g as well. and and that might start to occupy more of FB. And so the fact that uh, alpha B is largely constrained by alpha A um, is significant. Like, like if, we, if we fix this, then we have, it kind of implies what this has got to do to complete the job. Um, the fact that it's staying, true for all of these different ones means there's not much choice for this. This kind of follows along once we can pick one of them. Um, it, it, the others will kind of be transported along as he puts it. Um, so we, we kind of know what this has to be to complete the square nicely um, to be lawful. And and that ends up being really significant for things like the Yoné dilemma, um, and that that sort of general general reasoning that often these natural transformations are quite rigidly defined, and parametric polymorphism and Haskell, uh, you know, also gives that sort of rigidity or or orderliness. It it makes sure that you're not specifying some wacko function for how safe head operates on ints versus on bools. You're not just saying, you know, for when it maps doubles, I want it to do something differently. And when it maps a string, I want it to insert my name into the results or something like that, which wouldn't be a, a very lawful thing to do. Parametric polymorphism says, you're not allowed to do that. You have to specify it for all types. Therefore, you don't know what the type is. and Therefore, you can't do something wacko, um, you know, for certain types. You don't know what it is. You can't give a special rule for it, a special, special exception. So, um, uh, natural transformations, we'll see, you know, offer this beautiful property, and th that gives some very strong results um, that are are very interesting with the Yoné dilemma. As we'll see for dynamical systems, um, it allows us this really nice way of expressing things, the fact that the Yoné dilemma applies. Anyway, this is, um, um, this is part of this. Okay, so we're gonna need to, to pick for next time. I'm, I'm, I know we're all pretty good borrowed time here, but I want your feedback. For next time, so Friday, two days from now, 
do we dwell on natural transformations further or do you know and i have some other examples and so on or do we go on to talk about a different topic um from our our sort of categorical menu here um my, my thought would be probably to hit pro functors um here we we'll, we'll probably do pro functors um but we could spend time on natural transformations just like we did with functors or just like we did with universal constructions um so does anyone want to express preferences here maybe i'll ask you folks i think we can vote gosh um if we could vote right um yeah so there are these little widgets in the reactions area um uh okay i don't want to download emojis thanks very much um uh <laughs> Um, there's these little little things here, uh, like a check mark or an X, or you could do a thumbs up uh, versus, I, I don't know, I don't see a thumbs down. No emojis, thank you. Um, uh, okay, so um, can anyone express, um, uh, who would like to go on to pro functors next time? Um, and, and, and hit on the topic of profuncture so we can get to lenses and optics, which will start to get us in the position us more fully to deal with polynomial functors and dynamical systems. Would like to do those things. Anyone indicate? Uh, okay. Profunctors, profunctors. Okay. Um, who would like to stay more on natural transformations? Okay, okay, um, okay. So I, I am hearing a vote for natural transformations. Okay, so what I think I'm going to do um, is uh, I will prepare some slides of profunctors uh, in case we need them, but I want to be sure that any questions on natural transformations are included. And um, uh, I'm, you know, I'm willing to do another session if we could get some queries or confusions or, or things to talk about that you find stumbling blocks or interesting and you want to understand it better. Um, I will come with some slides on natural transformations, but I'll also have some things of pro functors in case the, that wraps up early and we want to go on to pro functors sooner. But uh, my thought is, if, if even one person is, you know, would like more coverage of natural transformations, is probably because of some confusions or some queries or curiosities or um, points that need discussion. So please come with those points. Please think actively about which elements of this might confuse you. Um, and there are one or two subtle aspects of it that I think I will highlight next time, um, which I didn't get to today, okay? Okay, I think that's all for today. And I will look forward to talking a little bit more about natural transformations next time, maybe going over two or three additional examples. and talking about non-examples or or things where there's a fly in the ointment um and uh we'll be poised to go on to pro functors when you folks are ready for it okay okay great thank you thank you